if you will also be committed as partners and friends of this ministry to help us continue this work for a long, long time. God bless you. As the World Missions Director for Florida, I travel all across this country raising money for missions. Sometimes I speak in large churches and at other times in very small ones. If the Holy Spirit is given the liberty to move upon the people, I see miracles of giving. Recently, in a very small church in Florida, I saw an offering of $133,000. I've seen offerings as high as $4 million. It's astounding what happens when people begin to see their potential in God. All fear is removed. They begin to think in the world of supernatural supply, and God begins to provide through their lives. The Bible says the liberal soul shall be made fat. The one who withholds more than is necessary will be impoverished. Dan Betzer here, and that's Byline. Byline has been brought to you by the Assemblies of God churches. First time in my mind that murder but this is how the devil began to lead me on that path. The interviews you haven't heard today. You're watching the Daystar Television Network. It is so great to have you. We're going to have a wonderful, wonderful time. My sweetheart we? always says, hello, everybody. That's because I'm from the deep south. Yes. And we have accents, and we talk slow, and we draw our words out. No, we don't have a strong accent as we did 20 years ago when we started in television. Well, that is true. So. <laughs> and we're going to go back 20 one years in time in just a moment. 21 years? Yes, we are. Oh, We're going to see some hairdos. Oh, my We're goodness. going to hear some accents. <laughs> it's going to be one for the ages. I hear you. I hear well, you. Joni, two of our dear friends are pastors Hank and Rhonda Davis of Church of the Harvest in Cleveland, and Tennessee. And they're here today. They are here. And we're delighted <laughs> that they are here. The Cleveland is close to Chattanooga. And of course, uh, many of you are watching us live right now in Cleveland on Charter Cable Channel 8. We're so delighted that we're on there in the greater Bradley County. And hello, Chattanooga. You that are watching on Comcast, yes. Digital Cable Channel 296. Yes. So all of that area, I went to uh, Lee College, which is now Lee University, and I did happen to graduate, probably bribed my way through yes. or talked my way through. Somehow, I did manage to graduate, so we love the people from that area. Pastor Hank was in our wedding. He was. How many years ago was that? He was in our wedding, and we will be celebrating very soon 24 years. 
that wow, we've been married. Wow, almost a quarter of a century. Yes, yes. That's a long time. And yes. I knew Hank and Rhonda before they were married. You did. When Rhonda was just a young teenage waitress at a steak restaurant. Yes. How about that? Well, we're going to hear more about their great testimony. Let me just say this. They were both raised in ministers' homes. They got married. Problems came. They ended up divorcing. They were divorced for three years. Yes. God restored their marriage supernaturally, and that's been almost 22 years that it has stood the test of time. So if you know somebody that's gone through a divorce or is going through one, you need to tell them to tune into this program today or go press the record button because it's going to be a great hope and encouragement. It was a... Uh I'll tell you what, it's such an incredible story how God restored their marriage. I mean, to think that they were divorced for three years and God restored their marriage. So you want to be sure and stay tuned for that story. Listen, if Johnny was divorced from me for three hours, I don't think I could get her back. Honey, I'm not divorcing you. I'm All staying right. with you. Are you going to stay with me? Yeah. Okay. So I know you got your Father's Day jacket on. And who got that for me? I did. Doesn't he look you cute did? today? You got that for and me. And I got this shirt for him. Even though I'm not even your father? Yeah. And you kind of match. I'm, I'm the father of your and you children. you match the singers today, kind of. Hey, can I sing with them today? Absolutely. You could sing Hallelujah Anyhow. Never, I could never do that. let your troubles get you down. Honey, I wouldn't want to, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, show out in front of Joe because it might, yeah. might intimidate I him. I know. You know, I just hurt his confidence Especially a little bit. Especially if you played the keyboard and sang. Oh, if I did yeah. both, oh, both, dual threat. Dual, dual threat. threat. Oh, man. <laughs> that would be something. Who knows if I could pull oh, it off. Oh, but we do um, love the Daystar Singers and Band. Don't you love the Daystar Singers and Band? Those of you watching, I know that so many of you call and write. They're such a blessing, and uh, I love all of those peoples over there. That's my peoples, the peoples. over there. The Even peoples. one of them named their dog after me. Think about that. I don't that. know if that's good or bad. How close is that? I mean, just treat you like a One dog. One of the best dogs he's ever had. Isn't that right, Scotty? Oh, it is. That's right. Little Joni is one of the little best Little Joni Lamb. Scotty, dogs. stand up and tell how's little Joni Lamb doing. She's doing great. She She's is. actually the most beautiful dog The I most have. beautiful dog. Oh. Yeah. Thank you very much. i got to work with her Thank on some other much. stuff, but she sure is pretty. <laughs> what, what kind of dog is she? Does she have brown eyes like Joni? She has, yeah. She's got yeah. really dark brown eyes. She's an Australian Shepherd. Okay. Oh, those are supposed to be smart dogs. <clears throat> but it was so cute because, do we have a picture of Pepper that we could show? Honey, Pepper is the most wonderful dog. Someone wrote in and said, Marcus and Pepper favor. Look. <laughs> you see the little goatee and everything. <laughs> Our goatees are similar. <laughs> This is true. Honey, but he's so cute, I wouldn't mind being compared to him. He's the sweetest he fella. He is, and he likes to sing. He does. And yes. I'm still very concerned that you didn't let Pepper sleep with you when the storm came. Honey, he was sleeping on the couch. He was fine. And he was barking at the storm, and he was scared about the storm. That's right. He barks at everything. If anybody comes to the front door, Honey, he just goes Can you tell wild. everybody about Runway and what's happening with him? Well, honey, we got to wait till we get our pictures, oh. but we do have something to share with our viewers, and that is when we were on vacation flying back to Dallas at the airport, there was a little dog that was a little stray, and so he looked horrible. He had mange. A pitiful looking dog I've ever seen. But the sweetest. Sweetest. And it was, it was probably puppy. I don't, I'm, we're thinking seven, eight months old. So anyway, I fed it some crackers and, you know, and it was just pitiful. And so... It sounded like it was starving. We got... We, we came, it had the mange. Just yeah, big, big chunks, chunks of, of hair, hair all out. missing from its so body. So anyway, we came back. We got <clears> home. <throat> we came home and saw Pepper. And he's just so blessed and spoiled and lives in the house. And Marcus said, honey, I feel so bad for that little dog. So I said, well, we could call my sister because we were in Macon, Georgia. This is where we were. And I could send her back to the airport and see if they and could find brother, that dog. And my brother, don't leave out my brother, no, who's out, married to your sister. We won't leave out Gary because we love him. And so I called her and I said, will you go back and see if you can find that dog? Take it to the vet. And Gary and Christy are the champion and we'll of pay taking for care it, of pets. Marcus and Joni, and then we'll put his picture on TV and see if we can get a home for him. And we do Pep's Furry Friends that Georgia. Rose is working on. Pep's yeah, new Pep's program. Furry Friends. 
And so anyway, they took him to the vet, and everything was treatable. He's so sweet. And now Gary and Christy have But him. you didn't We're tell gonna... it all. When Gary went back to the airport to retrieve him, yes. the animal control people had been called. The animal control people they were, were there, about to Kendra, get him. ready to get him. You yes. know what my brother did, just like his big brother, he took the van and parked it so in the, the driveway so the animal leave. control people couldn't leave. That's Blocking right. their way. That's right. Then demanded the release of that dog. That's right. And so, <laughs> wasn't quite like that. Wasn't quite, quite like that. that. But, but he did block the driveway. He did block the driveway. <laughs> and he, he said, have you got a dog in there that looks like such and such? Because this dog is a dog that would not have they had come to get on him. this earth. He would have been promoted to doggy heaven. But he was still locked up in this room right. so they at the got airport. Him, and so he's being treated. We're going to show you a picture. Someone in the Macon, Georgia, Atlanta area, area, we want you to adopt. He is sweet, and we named him sweet. Runway. Because that's where we found, found him. on the runway. Yeah, so. how about that? Did you like that? Yeah. Did y'all like that story, singers? Well, I know Johnny, Michelle liked it. She cries over everything. Aww. Michelle, isn't that a sweet story? So sweet. Yeah. I'm telling you. He is, a, he is yeah. a very extra sweet dog. Yeah, that was the thing. He, in all his pain and the fact that he was starved, he still was sweet. Oh, and Gary got him in the van. He thought, now this dog gonna is going to run, run, all, run over all over this van. And Gary said, that dog sat right, right beside him. Just he wagged knew. his tail and was just so sweet, <laughs> yes. so happy, so content. A pepper's not like that when he a gets A pepper in the wouldn't car. be that way. He would be <laughs> all over everywhere. But he's getting better, Mom. Okay. All right, why don't you get ready to sing? To sing. To sing. All right, okay. since we're going to go back down to Southern Memory Lane in a few minutes, it'd be sang probably. But anyway, here are calls and emails. Oh, these are emails. This is from Tamanuda, India. From Toronto, Ontario, Canada. From Kuwait City, Kuwait. Here are others from uh, India. Here is from uh, the Netherlands. Isn't that neat? How about that? I like that. Here's the Dominican Republic, Colombia, South America, Puerto Rico, Costa Rica, Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic. More from Canada, more from England. Many that are watching on Sky, and we're going to be coming to see you, Great Britain, very, very soon. I'll be telling you more about that coming to Denver, Colorado this Wednesday. We'll be telling you more about that, other things that are happening. But our prayer partners are standing by live right now, godly men and women who know how to pray. And uh, can we just show a picture of our prayer partners? There we go. Look at these wonderful men and women there, live, ready to pray with you night and day. Or you can go to daystar.com and click on prayer. Here is a great song by Joni and the Daystar Singers and Band entitled, For the Rest of My Life.
Well, that is so true. Don't you feel like praising him right there? And whether you feel like it or not, he's worthy of our praise. In fact, if you don't feel like it, that's probably the best time to praise him because he said, I will dwell in the praise of my people. So when you don't feel like it, that's when you need to praise him. So his presence will come. You can be refreshed and receive all that God has for you. Well, it is a delight for Joni and me to have uh, Pastors Hank and Rhonda Davis back with us today. You've seen Rhonda many times at the women's conference, but there's always a good man behind every woman, oh, or at least most I of the hear. time. I like that kind of is the opposite saying, isn't it? It's supposed to be there's a good woman yeah, behind every I noticed every that you man. got that confused. Yeah, That's well. okay. <laughs> yeah, huh? What can I say? The women uh, rule. I just... Go ahead and admit. Women rule, the men rule. That's what the girls say, don't they? Rachel <laughs> yeah. and Becca say that. No, we honor, oh, we honor our men. We honor our men as the head that where God has placed you. I'm glad you're the head and I'm not, because I would hate to have to make all the important decisions. You just like helping me yeah, make them, don't like you? when we're buying big TV stations <laughs> in big markets, and you have to do the... <laughs> and it's millions of dollars. Those are very important yes. decisions. Well, anyway, they pastor Church of the Harvest in Cleveland, Tennessee. And uh, Pastor Hank was in our wedding. I'm going to show you a picture in just a moment. But let me introduce them to you. And let's welcome them. Miss Rhonda, Pastor Hank, God bless you. Well, can we go back and show that wedding picture? Let's see if we can pick Hank out in there. Hank, where are you in that picture? Let's see. You, Hank is over the, the back row. And if you're looking at your screen, the second to the left. The good looking one. On the back right. Is that him? That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. And look, yeah. Th there, he, there is. he is. Look, See? yeah. Harry's got a good tan. He always has a good tan. Yeah. Okay, now, Cindy let's Price go back. There. Cindy Price was there at our wedding She too. was? Yeah. Why wasn't she in the picture? She went in my, oh. she was at one of my bridesmaids. You didn't know her as well that didn't then, know did her you? As well. Hey, let's go back. <laughs> Johnny was talking about 20 years ago that we had accents. Well, we did. But Joni also had big hair. Big hair. I still do. Not she still has, big. but it was larger hair. Yes. So let's go back to 1985. <laughs> Why do you want to show me? To when we first started in Christian television. Oh, Lord. Built the first Christian TV station in the history of the state of Alabama, Channel 45. We affectionately refer to it as 45 Alive. It's still a Christian television station today in Montgomery. And Daystar is on in Montgomery. If you're watching in the greater central Alabama area, call and say hello. But let's go now to vintage classic footage, oh, 1985. No. Joni Lamb right. and her guest, Rhonda Davis. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Okay, Joni, um, Hank's already shared a little bit, but um, we met in 1979 when we married in 1979 also. We only dated a few months, and I also had been raised in a Christian minister's home. I had a beautiful parents and more love than I ever could have dreamed of. And Hank and I married, and he was serving the Lord at that time, and I thought that he would continue to. But after we'd been married a few months, as he said, he went back on God. And I was so devastated. And I remember one night rolling over in bed and smelling cigarette smoke on his breath. And I thought that was just the worst thing in the world. Of course, I had been raised in a Christian home, never been around anything like that. And to me, that was about the worst thing that could happen. But I didn't know what Satan had in store to try to do to us. Was that the first sign then? The, that was the first the cigarette sign. cigarette smoking, he tried to hide that from you? Yeah, he tried to hide the cigarette smoking. And uh, he would... Uh, you know, stay out of church a lot. That and the cigarette smoking, he would stay out of church, but he would try to hide that from me. And then one night I, you know, smelled it on his breath and I said, are you smoking? And he just turned over and he wouldn't answer me. And so after that... Let's go back and get some more of Joan. I mean, Rhonda, I, that, that could not be Rhonda. Okay, Rhonda, was that really me. you? It was not me. I don't know who that was. Was now, that an imposter? It was an imposter. We have, it was my <laughs> evil sister, Latonda. We have, oh, my gracious. We have a producer who believes in equal time, so let's go to the vintage footage now of Marcus. So let's show that and real Pastor quick. Hank. And Pastor uh -oh. Hank. Uh -oh. yeah. But, Hank, we could, we could take a lot of time and talk about a lot of things, but let's just get right to the beginning. In that revival, it was a great revival, and you were youth director 
I believe, was your position at that time. And things were going really well. But soon after that, the devil decided that he had it out for you. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to bring one Hank Davis down. Tell us the story. Well, Mark was probably coming from the home of a preacher's kid, you know, quote, unquote. Growing up, growing up in church and growing up in the house of God, you know, there, there are times when God's going to speak to you and God's going to talk to you. And as a young child, I always felt the call of God on my life and always seemed like other things always came first. And my relationship with God was more or less what everybody else was doing, that's what I was doing. If my friends were Christians, then I'd be a Christian. If they weren't, then, then I would. And that kind of went on for several years, all the way through high school and even through college. And uh, when we met in Southern California, it seemed as, as if God had uh, called me into a ministry and we were working there with the youth. And, and I had met Rhonda. And uh, we were just be beginning to date at that time. And I just got... Well, we're going to hear more of this story in a moment. That's really good that they didn't get a close-up of us. Of you and Hank. I love that the director watching. Did they get one more of Joni? Did they? Oh, no, yeah. They're finding one. Well, now, why do you want to show me? We need to get in their testimony. We need to forget about showing like me. Because I see my sweetheart. Well, they need to get a close-up of you. I want people to see. And all your hair. That you're more beautiful today <laughs> than you were even then. No, we just have better cameras, actually. <laughs> Better lighting. Oh, my sweetheart does so, hair and makeup. Now, do y'all remember? Rhonda, do you remember that? Absolutely. Do you? Like it was yesterday, and we thought that was so and incredible. That was Latonda, not Rhonda. Yeah, it was Latonda. <laughs> it had to be Latonda. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. I love it. So now, you know, we really went down memory lane yesterday because they were on the Joni show and, and we... Oh, they were on the best show first. Well, no, no one say that, but we did... Oh, actually, the Bible we, said you saved the best wine We for did last. three shows, and so those will be coming up, and we... Rhonda tells her story, Hank tells his story, and then we had them together. Well, let's just go into this right now. It is very rare that if somebody gets divorced... Mm -hmm that they get remarried to the same person, especially three years later, especially if they're both in the ministry. I can tell you this, that it, when they did get divorced, there came a point to where their family and friends and ministers on both sides of their family, probably 95% of them or more, basically said to both of them, give up. Uh, don't have any hope. Y'all are not going to get back together. Move on with your lives. But let's let's go back to the beginning. Hank, uh, Rhonda was a beautiful teenage uh, minister's daughter, and you were a pastor's son, and you were real dynamic and outgoing. And what caught your attention about Rhonda initially? <laughs> Obviously, not her accent. <laughs> I think everything about her, I mean, she was alive, vivacious, loved the Lord, and there was a, an innocence, a purity, just fun. R Rhonda was always fun. No matter what she was doing was fun. And when I met Rhonda, she was 13, and I was 19. Wow. And so I dated her sister first because I couldn't date her. So I said, well, I'll get my foot in the door anyway. It sounds anyway. like a story <laughs> in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, the, I think, just the fun. She, she loved life. She loved God. There was a real, you know, being a preacher's kid, sometimes you see the good, bad, and the ugly. But she loved the Lord, it's obvious, and that was a, I think that was definitely a, an attraction, and of course, she's awful, awful pretty. <laughs> that always helps. <laughs> so, Rhonda, what'd you think about this guy that was much older than you, and uh, he had a great personality, and loved life, and was involved in all kind of things? How did that get your attention? Oh, I just thought he was so wonderful, and he was so handsome, and so Californian in his looks, and he was so intelligent and just always the life of the party. He's always been a people person. Yes. And so full of charisma. And uh, I was just drawn to him, just just loved him. Okay, so Hank, you dated for how long? About a, about a year, I guess, off and on. Um, started dating her when she was a senior in high school. She was homecoming queen, Miss Upland. So got to be a part of all of that. And uh, that summer really was when we felt like it was it was time to ask her to marry me. And I asked her in a in the middle of the summer, got the uh, owner of the restaurant convinced to put a fireplace in the, start light the fire. Is Shakey's Pizza or Shakey's, uh, Pizza. Shakey's Pizza? In the middle of the summer, had a fire going, and uh, he played once, twice, three times late, and I got on my knees, I think, and asked her to marry me, and she said yes. Wow. <laughs> okay, so you finally got married, and it started out good. Right. 
When did it start going bad? Well, it really didn't start out good. Well, it didn't start out good? No, because well, at the wedding, the best man fainted. I don't know. The flowers got knocked over, and the car broke down on the way to the honeymoon. That is true. This is not a good <laughs> start. True. Well, one of the girls in her, in, on her side, while her dad was praying for us, you heard this thud. And you looked over, and there was one of the bridesmaids stretched out. Oh, no. And she had gained some weight since she had put her dress on. So to try to fit the dress, she didn't eat for like two days. And so she, she was the, the flowers. The, he, I don't know why my brother passed. He just passed out. He just ate. I had a, a friend that was a bodybuilder kind of caught him and held him up there during the rest of the ceremony. So that was like. And your brother passed out yes, too? Yes. Yes. He was the best man. He, right in the middle. Well, I, mean, I, I don't know. This might have been some signs. <laughs> I, like I lost our watching. money for the honeymoon. I yeah. lost a thousand dollars cash. Uh, blew up her dad's Mercedes. Went to Tahoe. No snow. So yeah, it really didn't get off. On a, we should have, you know, sought counseling then, I think. <laughs> okay, so then, as far as, though, as the marriage part, I guess the marriage part, though, started out okay. And the, but what were the first signs of impending problems, Rhonda? I think um, Hank really, you know, started putting himself into his business, and he was running from the call of God on his life. So a lot of frustration was there and um, working hard. And then he started really missing church and getting out of the community of faith, a little step by step, and started getting into the cigarettes, which led to marijuana, which led to cocaine, until he became somebody I never had met. Wow. He was not the man I married, not the man I fell in love with, not this beautiful man who loved God. His life became He was not something. the man of your dreams anymore. Now no. he's the man of your nightmares. Right. So, Hank, here you were. You were raised in church all your life. Godly parents. They were pastors. And you married this beautiful young lady. What happened to you? What caused you to, to spiral down that road? Well, I think Rhonda mentioned the, the two choices in life. One, to pursue the things of God. And being a preacher's kid, again, you see the good and the bad. And, and a great home, great parents, great relationship. And always had time for us, but, and, and enjoyed church, the church music, the, the softball, all that. But it was like, there was a, a, a pool here, but I felt good about constructing, felt like this is what I wanted to do. And in that, kind of started hanging with the wrong people, that, you know, the, the, the social drinking, the, the little and occasional. And construction workers can be a rough crowd yes, sometimes. Sir. Yes, sir. And, and I had about, at that time, 30 framers. We were, we were framing supermarkets, custom homes, restaurants. And, and I like to hang with the guys. It wasn't that I'd show up on the truck and, and, and just sit there, but I'd get out on the job and, and mingle a little bit. And I was sharing yesterday that the, the pressure of all the construction, one morning, one of the foreman called and said, hey, my truck's messed up. Can you, can you take me to the job? I said, yeah, I'm going. I'll pick you up. And on the way to work, I, I did some cocaine. Didn't really like cocaine. It was, you know, earlier in life. So did that guy offer it to you or yes, something? Yes, just said, hey, just. And so that day, I had all the, and that's what Coke does. It gives you a false sense of, uh, uh, you, know, you handle all the situations, answer all the questions, owners, inspectors, contractors. And so that afternoon, the way home, I went by his house. I said, uh, I said, hey, you, you got any more, he got any more Coke? He said, well, I don't have any. I'll give you, but I'll sell you. And that. Because he had told you to try a little bit. Yes. He and, gave, it, no, and, just, it, and you felt like it helped you through the day with did. the pressures. Yeah, it and did. It was a false reality. It was a, and so because. Kind of like how some people will turn to alcohol for the same at least they think that's what well, it's going to be Well, it's a fake for euphoria. For, yeah. At that moment, you feel like you're on top of the world. And because we had money, it wasn't, it wasn't, I went immediately to a hundred dollar day habit. And of course, 30 years ago, that was wow. a lot of coke. And yes, then it was. got to where it didn't sleep, was coked out all the time. And that's where the nightmare began because it wasn't a home. It was her trying to, she was teaching the Sunday school choir. She's involved in church. We had a great church there in Southern California. And she tried to be involved. And everybody said, well, where's Hank? Where's Hank? And I think she tried to make excuses, but it was like a whole, it was two people, it was two different worlds. I had an evil, evil world, and she was trying to bring balance, and she'd never been around anybody on drugs, the profanity, the, all the violence, had never, had never seen that, the anger and the temper. And not to make excuses for, for sin, but if somebody's never been on cocaine, they don't know how it can totally control your life. Somebody close to Joni and I told me one time, that it is the most addictive thing in the world. And he even made the statement, he said, you would sell your mother true. to get yeah. some more cocaine. Yeah. That's how driven you become mm -hmm. to want and, to have and, it. And of course, now meth, we're hearing yes. the, Crystal the, meth. the tragedies, you know, with so it's many people. It's twice as addictive, as, easier to get a hold of, as cocaine. cost less. Wow. Teen Challenge now 
feels 18 months recovered instead of 12 for cocaine. Wow. So it is a monster. We were talking just a bit about bass fishing. When you get that hook in the fish's jaw, you've got the fish. And that's coke. It, it reels you in. It lets you out. You think you're okay. People say, why? Well, I, I, quit, I quit time I want. No, they can't. Mentally, they put it to the side, but it, it reels them back in. And that was the monster. And you're talking about, I took money out of my grandmother's purse to get coke. I would rather spend time with cocaine than with my wife. So I had an affair with drugs. Yeah. And, that, and that's scary when you think about, because Ron has always been beautiful, always been wonderful, but that I'd rather do drugs and spend quality time with my wife. That's, that's what coke does. That's what mm -hmm. drug, alcohol, any, and anything like that. And of course, like you that. didn't realize the damage that you were doing to her emotionally, because so many times you'd be high, and Rhonda, he'd come home, and you, you've told me so many times there were so many bad memories Did in you your home. Did you know he was doing drugs, Rhonda? At first I didn't. His, his behavior was so erratic. It was Jekyll Hyde, but I didn't know the signs. I'd been raised in a minister's home. And someone came over and confronted him, and I even believed that he wasn't doing the cocaine. But then he told me he was. He admitted that he was. And the signs, his behavior, the anger, the frustration they go through, I lived in constant, you know, fear and mm -hmm. feeling rejected, so rejected, because that other woman was cocaine. I felt rejected and hopeless, and I felt like God had forsaken me, you know, that so, God had turned his back. And, of course, tell us about the morning that you wanted to go to church. What happened? I woke up one Sunday morning, and I wanted to go to church to teach the children's ministry there. And I went and asked Hank, he was sleeping in another bedroom, if I could have the keys of the car. And he said, no. Hank. And I said, well, that man's dead. <laughs> this is not the same man. Right. And um, <laughs> he said, you can't, he said, you can't have him. I said, well, I, I can't call anybody. The phones are disconnected. He said, I don't care how you get there. Just get there. And so I walked to church that morning in the rain, feeling so sorry wow. for myself. And I said, God, where are you? I said, God, you know, I prayed about this marriage. I married a Christian man. Where are you now? And God seemed so far away from me, but in a small, still voice, he said, Rhonda, I promise you a miracle. Wow. He All right, now to put this in perspective yes. about how far into the marriage was this? About a year and three months into the marriage. Okay. And uh, that was the day that I left Hank. Even though God... You left him that day? I left him that God day. promised you a miracle. I did. Why did you leave then if because God promised you Because my heart was flooded with bitterness, Marcus. This is a year and a half. And pain. Yes. And yes. Rejection. You know, the heart is like caverns and caves. Things get stuck back in there. Psalms 44 and 21 says, Shall not God search this out? For he knows the secret places of the heart. In the secret place of my heart, there was so much bitterness. I couldn't see change in this man, even when he did change, until God healed me. That day, I just wanted to get away. I was afraid. I wanted to get to a safe place to where I didn't have to deal with a husband on cocaine. And so I left that day. Hmm. So your mother flew in yes. to help you. Yes. And about the time you are starting to leave, I guess, tell us about what happened. Hank showed up. He showed up at the house. And when I saw him, he looked a little bit different. And he started crying and followed me around. He'd go from crying to being angry with my mom and I. And my mom would begin to reason with him. And um, I noticed he looked different, but I couldn't figure out what the different was. And then he would cry and say, just please don't leave. You're the only one that really loves me. Please don't leave me. And I just said, Hank, I've got to go. And he said, well, come to church and watch me get saved. I'm going to get saved. And I said, no, Hank, I've watched you get saved too many times. I'm not coming. I'm leaving. And he did go to church. He did get saved that night. But he really got saved. He really got saved. He so really... what was the difference, Hank, in that night from the other times you had prayed? I think the, the drugs had got to a place where it, it had me to a degree that it frightened me. That she talked about the night before we had we had gone to a party and, and that night several things had been introduced and I mixed peyote, which is a hallucinatory drug, with cocaine, with alcohol, with and that particular night I went through several things where, where, where I freaked out. I just completely lost it. And that that next morning I realized, man, I am I am actually my reflection hallucinating told me, you're killing yourself. I don't care. I mean, I'm talking, that's how bad it, my face melt. I mean, it's just a scary. Wow. So when she, when, when she walked in that day, it was like, I, I am killing myself. I am destroying, I, I am not going to survive. There have been some experiences with a loaded pistol. Some, I had a sports car ran down Beach Boulevard hoping somebody would uh, run a light. I mean, just, just desperate. And so when, when she came in that day, I felt like, you know, this is, I just, I just really need to, to start all over. Well, she said, no, it's not, it's not going to happen. And then I went to church that night, kind of thought she'd be there, you know, because I called to talk to her mom. And, but that particular night, it was obviously, it was a God, it was a God time. It was God had, had it was my time. So you really, you reached the bottom. 
with the drugs, rock, with rock your bottom. relationship, with your marriage. Rock. And sometimes people have got to reach that point. And, and it's even that way with us parents. Sometimes we keep our kids from ever reaching that bottom point to where they will cry out to God on their own. Yeah. Is that true, yeah. Hank? Weighed 119 pounds. I wasn't smoking, but I was lighting three packs of cigarettes a day. I'd be so coked out, I'd light a cigarette, lay it down, forget about it, go light another one. I mean, I mean it was just, it was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was almost like, not a dream, a nightmare, <clears throat> but it was at a place where, you know, we were talking earlier about, about Rhonda. Well, I felt like she has a new house, she has a nice car, she has all the toys, all the furniture. I'm providing for her, so I should be able to do my own thing. That selfishness, you know, at that particular time in my life was, you know, she can't cry for fuss because I'm not going to church. I'm trying to make a living. And you justify everything you do you, you justify it, you, you know. And that's what the devil is. He's a deceiver. So yes, he had yes. you deceived that because you did all these nice things for her that you should be able to do what you wanted to do. Yes. And it forced us to hang around guys that were single. That doesn't help when you got single guys talking about, uh, well, you're going home to your, well, I, don't, I shouldn't have to do what she tells me to do and, and fought that and, and work through that too. So now you left to go to the airport and Hank, you realized she was going to fly back. To well, what was so How'd I woke up. That out, that I woke was... up Monday morning, healed. We talked yesterday. I I laid marijuana, alcohol, wine coolers, drugs. It, never again. And no, that no night. withdrawals. No. From that no. moment no. From to that, this moment. That none. 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 That's been how Amazing. many years ago, Hank, that you've been delivered? Twenty-five all years ago. Twenty-five, 25 years ago. Five so years we can say to ago. the devil, he's a liar. Yes, he is. We can say to people that are watching today that are bound by drugs or alcohol, you can be set free. God set this man free twenty-five years ago. No relapses, no withdrawals. He didn't Amazing. have to go to a drug rehabilitation center. The power and the love of God totally set him free. All right, so how did you know she was leaving? Didn't. Got up that next morning. I, I called one of the contractors, one of our jobs that I was running. I said, I want to come to work today. He goes, he goes what do you mean? Well, I want to run a skill saw. I want to run a, a hammer. I want to work today. He goes, well, you know, mentally, you could hear him thinking, well, you're a drug addict. You know, you're... I showed up, worked all day in the sun, ran a skill saw, ran a framing hammer, went home that afternoon and knew, I just knew she was leaving. I don't know why, I just knew. And so I did some research. There were three cities, and you know Ontario, LA, Orange County airports. There were like 15 flights, and I assume she's going to Chattanooga. I picked one. A fifth, three cities, 15 flights, I picked one. Went to LAX. She wasn't there. I said, well, I missed it. I, I felt like some walking out of the airport, and here comes her and her mom rushing to try to catch the flight. Wow. Of all the flights, God, I mean, and I, I, killed, I carried her hand, or carry on back. At that time, you could go right on the airplane. And w went through, and I said, I said, Rhonda, I said, if I change, Will you come back? Now, she doesn't remember saying that she would because she was so frightened because I was carrying a loaded gun. I was sleeping with a, a pistol. I thought the narcotics, all, I mean, you know, you, you're so paranoid. So yes. she was afraid that I was going to drag her off the plane. I don't know what she thought, so but she, she probably said, said it just to get rid of She you. did. She said yes. And that one word, you know, when Peter stepped out of the boat, he didn't walk on the water. He walked on the word. Jesus said, come. I operate on that word, she said yes. It gave you hope. Yes, and but for three years, there was no hope. I so, Ronnie, you don't even pro remember promising him that? No, when he says that, you know, I, I think, well, maybe I remember it, but I know I just said it like you said. I was just afraid and wanted to get out of there, but he held on to that word, and our Father in Heaven held on to that word. Okay, so you go, you go back to, Cle to Tennessee to your family, and you eventually enroll in Lee College. We just mentioned that, the school that I went to. Leanne that sings some of the Daystar Singers, she went to that school. Uh, but, and, but Hank really had changed, and you started hearing some stuff about it, but you didn't believe it, did you? I didn't believe it. At first, I just thought, there's no way God would use him. And then I thought, well, God will just use anybody if God will use and him. And mad because... Because God used the donkey, so God he could use Hank, <laughs> and, and then Hank makes his way to Tennessee, where you are. And what he, did you, you are really you furious heard that, then. that he had Completely moved to angry and freaked out. He'd been working out and bleached his hair blonde and was tan. And this huge man, I left a 118-pound drug addict. He comes 180 pounds. You know, I'm going to win you back. And I was like, I don't even care. <laughs> just get out of my face, you know. I, did, I just said, Hank, go back to where you came from because I'm going on with my life. I had filed for divorce because my heart couldn't see the changed man. Yes. Because it was covered up with hurt and bitterness. Well, Hank, when she did that, how did you still have hope? I mean, that, that's a pretty big, big rejection. You know, I, I think that, I don't think hope ever went away. I think that uh, in that season, and we mentioned yesterday, all but two people said, go on with your life. Go, go on, 
get married, get, you know, it's, it, that door's not going to open. But I remember you and, and Grandma, you know, my precious grandma, grandma, never gave yeah, up. She never, was wonderful. Never gave up. And, uh, and so the doors begin to open. The, the evangelistic doors were there, and we were gone so much that really stayed so busy that there wasn't a lot of time to reflect. And in that time, your attitude is, well, God, you healed this marriage. Why won't you? Where Jehoshaphat said, well, God, you did this. And let me Why say this. You? There was three or four girls in every church that had fallen in love with Hank. I mean, some pretty ones, too. Because yeah, he was the single traveling evangelist. Oh, yeah. So now, I don't... So the point, what I'm saying is, Hank could have gotten remarried to somebody else. Yes. But he kept holding on for this one right here. He did. And I want to, I know we're going to, I don't want to run out of time because we almost did yesterday on, on my program, but let's talk about... There's more time on celebration. That's right. <laughs> During this process, while you're evangelizing, and God is really making you the husband that, that you're eventually going to be. And you preparing said us. preparing you. Yes. Rhonda, you are going through a process, and I want you to talk a little bit about the healing because there's no way you two would be together had this not happened Hey, let with me say you. this. Even if you had gone back to him, if you hadn't have been healed, That's right. it probably would have been a disaster, wouldn't it? It would have been a disaster. And God began to move upon my heart. He said, I want to do something so awesome. I've looked inside of you, and I've seen wounds and scars. And I want to bind them up and heal you. And I said, Lord, I don't have any wounds and scars. I was going to church, uh, ministering to the church, North Cleveland Church of God, going to Lee University. He said, no, I've seen them. And you can't go into your destiny until I heal you. So the Lord began to, through a friend, he would come and pray and share scriptures. And the Lord reached inside of me. And he asked me, will you give me these hurts? Will you give me these bitternesses? And will you trust me? And will you trust me? He wouldn't tell me what he was going to do. He said, but I'm going to do something so amazing. And you you're going had to, no idea what he no had idea. planned. He said, but you're going to just be like a monument unto me when I've done. Well, who doesn't want that? Wow. And, um, and he said, but just trust me. And he walked me through obedience and healing. He healed me of the hurts. He walked me back through the house we lived in in Balboa Street in California. And you've got to tell one of those stories. Okay, the memories were um, just walk, going around the, the wall like a movie. And the, we were walking up into that house, and I sensed the presence of Jesus. And he said, we're going in here. I didn't want to because that house held fears and horror. And we went in and every room, memories would come being lived on the wall. And when the memories were done, it was like they were being pulled out of me. And he would say, there is no fear in this room for the presence of the Lord is in this room. And your God is king of this room. Every room that he said that, the light would come in and the darkness would be moved out. He remembered details I didn't even remember. Those hidden things, wounds and hurts and words and frustration and anger and disappointment with myself, with Hank, with God. And the Lord kept going. You know, he's a healer. He doesn't stop halfway. Every time I try to go to the door, he'd pull my hand and say no. And he would go to another room and he would heal me of those memories in that room until everything was done. And then Marcus and Johnny, I could sense and hear someone crying. And I looked and it was the Lord Jesus. And I remembered the scripture in Isaiah, surely he bears our sorrows. And I realized that he was taking those hurts right. off of me and he was putting them on himself. Right. He was bearing my pain. Right. He reached in so deep. He left not a stone unturned. Mm -hmm. Glory to his name. He took all of that out, every hurt, and then he said, I have come to heal you and now you will go forth into my destiny. And he walked through the healing and he walked through forgiveness with me and asked me to forgive myself because I had many errors and to forgive God because I blamed God wow. and to forgive Hank. And then he said, well, now that's all that's done, I have one more thing I'm going to ask you to do. And I said, what is he? goes, I want you to call Hank. I said, Lord, it's been three years. Your word says if you speak something, we don't perceive it. You'll speak it a second time. So I need a second and a third one on this. And the Lord says, I want you to do it. And I called him. He was evangelizing in Dalton, Georgia. But not calling him to reconcile. Oh, no. Oh, no. Just call Wait, him for I just to be friends. Something. I got to mention something here. <laughs> okay, Mr. Credit. That's right. Want, it was the Lord, but I did have a little part in this in that I had gotten Hank in to preach at this church. Yeah. And all during this time, I think I talked to Rhonda one time about it, and she said, well, I don't even know if I believe Hank is called to preach. I believe he's just doing that to try to get me back. That's right. That's what and I'm I saying. And I can understand why she would, 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 would think that. But I said, no, God really has called him. The hand of the Lord is upon him. God is using him. And then when he was there at Dalton, I knew it was only about 30, 40 
minutes away from Cleveland where Rhonda was. And I just felt compelled to call Rhonda. And I said, listen, you should at least just go and see for yourself. So you don't have to make any commitment to do anything, but just go and, and give God an opportunity now, right to go to that service. Right before you tell about calling him, Hank, I want you to tell Marcus, because I don't know if he's ever heard you say this. During the three years, especially that first year, when you're serving the Lord, believing God to restore your marriage, talk about how you'd sit in front of the telephone and pray that she would call. Oh. We were part of a, of a church in California, great church, the upper room there in Westminster. And so a bunch of guys, we go to church and pray all night. Well, we get a chair on Saturday night, we get a chair. Okay, guys, let's just agree that Ron, God would just bring Rhonda right back to California right now. Man, we, and we open one eye, and she wasn't there, we keep praying. I go home, and I look wow. at the phone, and I say, okay, in the name of Jesus, you know, she's going to call right now to wait. And I pick up, she's a doubt, yeah, it's working, you know, but <laughs> she never oh, called, wow. she never, I'd send her a letter, I'd try to call her friend and try to check up on her and hear what was happening, and, but there was always a faith level. I, there's something about faith, there's, or hope, I guess, there would Okay, you always so have Rhonda, hope in God. Because I want to, don't want to run out of time here. So you, did you call him before you went to the service in Dalton? How long before? Hours before? Days before? Weeks just, before? Just days. I called him and we talked and I said, Hank, I knew him. You know, I knew this man. I said, I'm just calling you because we're going to be friends. We're not getting back together, but God wants to bring closure. I'm going to come over and see you. I went over and ate lunch with him. We had a casual lunch at the end of that lunch. I said, Hank, this is the closed chapter in the book of our life. I'm going on, and I'm just going to kind of oh, slap hi. you up. I high five. But he took a deep breath, and he said, Rhonda, you're still my wife, and I'm still believing God for you. Oh, man. And How so did that? All right. What? All right. First, I have to ask, Hank, when she's saying this is a closed chapter, how did that affect you? It was, it, there was such a piece that... The fact, first of all, that she was eating lunch with me. I you mean, I was just was savoring that moment. Yeah. And then the fact that, that she did say, I forgive you. I, I let you, I, I release the hurt. Because it's important to know you're forgiven. Yes. It's tough when you've been hurt, you know, you, you, you go through emotions. But when you've hurt somebody and always carry that, can't make it right. When she forgave me, it was like, that was a part of the healing, okay? I believe now, three years, I've been learning how to be a godly husband, how to be a godly man, how to deal with my anger, how to, how to, how to give more than you take. And so I said, okay, I, 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 received, I received that forgiveness, but I believe we're supposed to be together. I believe God brought us together. I believe that we are, are supposed to. So, Rhonda, when he made that pronouncement to you, you're still my wife, I'm still believing God for you. <laughs> How did that affect you? <laughs> Marcus, I have to confess, I was nauseated. I wanted to throw up. I was no! sick. Yes. Oh, my God. You're thinking, Lord, I called him and asked for forgiveness, but I cannot believe you have not dealt with this. All man. right, so days later, then uh, I, I called you. Yes, sir. And why did you decide to go then? I guess, you know, wisdom coming from you. I always trusted you, you know, as a single evangelist, and I had not met Joni at this time. And were you curious when you were going? Also, were you anxious thinking, what's this going to be like? I sang all the way over there because I couldn't think about it. I was so <laughs> nervous, <laughs> wondering what God was doing, so did not want to go back to Him, but knew God's hand was on me, and God was not going to back did up. you know she was going to come to the service? I did. You know, Cedar Valley Church of God is a great church. Yes. Clayton Brown today is still there. Still there. A great man. And so all the ingredients were there. God was moving. God was flowing. I just felt like somehow if God could give him the service, I mean, he let me down on the phone. He let me down the chair thing, but maybe God would just do something. And sure enough, in the altar, she came three times in, in an altar ministry. God was Did Rhonda get saved? Well, I, you said the she, altar. She brought a bunch of friends <laughs> with her. It, it was a, you know that church is just a great yes. church. People great respond to altars. There. And there, something happened at the altar, but I felt like God just did a lightning bolt from her to me, and the church was full, probably. Okay, let's get back to Rhonda. So you're in this service. What are you thinking? Because you had already been skeptical about whether he was called to preach or not or just doing that to win you back. So right. pretty soon, you, I mean, the Holy Spirit will realize. let you know yes, he's the spirit of truth. He was being used by God mildly. He was preaching a great sermon on heaven, and I was listening. I was amazed at just, you know, his, his um, eloquence, his anointing, his heart for God. And for people, and you and were thinking, to this to is you. truly a miracle. This is truly a miracle. And I'm, he calls everyone to the altar, and I'm just standing there. And, and Hank says, "I want all of you to praise God for who He is and what He's done in your life." And I just said, "Thank you, Father. Here's the man I've hated, the man I had bitterness toward, 
And God, I thank you. I'm standing here cleansed and whole. And I just thank wow. you. I didn't say anything else, but I just praise you for what you've done in that moment is what Hank was talking about. That God reached in. And I like to believe, Marcus and Johnny, that at that moment, God just did the final thing. He revealed the love. Solomon says, love is like a mighty wow. river, like a fire. And it was just all covered up. And the Lord just uncovered it. And when I opened my eyes from this prayer time, my best friend, Melissa Kite, looked at me and said, oh, no. I said, oh, yes. Wow. It was all over me. That is great. <laughs> so God just restored that love in your heart for this man that you've been divorced from for three years. All right, we got seven minutes left, so we got to get y'all back married, uh, make y'all legal well, since well, you got two kids. Well, one, now. One, of the things, <laughs> one of the things that um, Hank told me we were talking last night is that during this time that as you decided to come back together and renew your relationship, and the Lord showed you that you would get married. Honey, you're jumping ahead. I got to ask the initial, okay. who made the initial okay. move after the Lord's rekindled this love in your heart? Somebody I'm had sure to approach Hank somebody. Did. I walked off the platform and, and walked up to her and took her hand. And I said, God just did something. And he said, yes, Aww, he did. And we held hands all the way to the restaurant, Hank, all the way to the, that's gonna make me cry. All, the, all the way. And then it was like the next day, it was like a, a brand new, all, you know, the, the garbage of all the past was Thank gone, no memories of Hallelujah. the drugs, the, the, the anger, the, the scream. It was all gone. It was like a brand, new, a brand new opportunity. It was like a brand new, and you talk about widening the slate clean and giving you, Praise forgetting those things that are behind, yeah. it happened. And we started dating. We started, it was like, it was like all over again. But it was a pure relationship. It was a pure, that's me. what yes. you were going to comment yeah. on, I think. Yeah. So y'all waited until your second wedding yes. night, and you told me you felt like a virgin all I did. over again. I think in that, in that one month of waiting for the Lord, although we, we had been married, we did not, I feel like God renewed my virginity. I feel like that God restored that. So on our second honeymoon wedding night, you know, we consummated our vows, and all the hurts of the bedroom from the, from the past several years, it was all gone. Yes, it was. Healthy, great. Okay. I'll have more to I always later. like numbers and perspectives and contrast. How long after that service that night in Dalton, Georgia, did you ask her to marry you? I think technically that that weekend we so were. So you asked her to remarry you, and then how a, long then before you did get a remarried? Month. A a month. She month. finished her. She finished her her her, her junior year at Lee University. And, and got, got that completed. And Rhonda, tell me about your parents because they had to be blown away and they probably might have been a little skeptical even themselves. They were. I don't remember with, whether they were, but what did they say to you when they you first were, told They them? were so tender to the way the Lord was dealing with me. Because they loved you. They wanted to protect they you. They wanted to protect me. They were tender. They knew God was working with me. And the friend that was working with me, Pastor Mark Schrade there in Virginia now, West Virginia, he talked to them as well and said, this is a work of God. And I shared with them what the Lord was doing. And when they saw the peace in me, and then they had some time with Hank, there was healing that transpired between them and oh, Hank. That's great. And they knew the hand of God. In the second wedding, everything was perfect. There's the North Cleveland Church oh, of God. Good. No one passed problems, out. Huh? Every song was to God be <laughs> Hank, the glory. Thank you. Lose the money. <laughs> no money lost. All right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wonderful, wonderful day of celebrating God's miracle. All right. We're gonna have a song that Rhonda's requested. I belong to you. Let me just say today. You know, I wish I could promise every one of you that if you've been divorced, you're going to get remarried to that same person. I can't promise you that. Most of the time, that doesn't happen. It did happen this time. 22 years now, they've been married. Two wonderful children, a great church and ministry. But I tell you, God can do anything. The key is, does God give you a rhema word about it? Does He give you a divine word and, and says, I'm going to, if He does, then you hold on to that. But let me also say, God doesn't work people against their will. That's right. People still have their own individual will. But here's the good news. If the other person doesn't cooperate and they're not obedient to God, God can send you somebody else. He can still heal your heart. He can still use you even though you've been divorced. And He can still do great things with your life. So today, if you need prayer, you've been through divorce or you're going through one, you need prayer, call today. We're going to have Pastors Hank and Rhonda Davis to pray for you. So let's go to this song right now, I Belong to You. Wow. 
Mountains rise and praise, and nature bows its face. But I belong to you. I need your love, like the flower needs the rain. I need your love I belong to you I belong to you Lord you Won't you take me Take me as I am Yield it to your to an end of this program today. Continue to call the number that's on the screen. If you get a voicemail, leave your name and number or leave your prayer request or go to daystart.com and click on prayer. We're going to ask pastors Hank and Rhonda Davis to pray for you. If you're ever in the Cleveland, Tennessee area, Church of the Harvest, it'd be a great church for you to go and visit. Rhonda, lead us in, in prayer today. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your divine power that is not limited to men, not limited to women, it's not limited to this earth, but God, it's found in your creative anointed power that breaks through bars and chains into hopeless cases. We pray for yes, hope so to be God. spoken. To those who feel there's no future, that future be spoken. God, that you are the God that does wonders, Lord, yes, so that you God. create and do mighty, powerful things in your name, Lord. And we speak hope and encouragement to every person that's called in, to everyone that's watching. God, that you would do something awesome. Awesome. Joyce Meyer has a practical, no-nonsense approach to help you understand the Bible and discover that it's really possible to enjoy everyday life. I'm going to enjoy my life, and I'm going to teach people how to enjoy theirs. Visit our website and find the stations where you live and start enjoying everyday life. I believe that God likes fresh and new things. And here at Joyce Meyer Ministries. There's always something relevant to your life on Enjoying Everyday Life with Joyce Meyer. First time in my mind that murder entered into my mind. And this is how the devil began to lead me on that mm -hmm. path. The interviews you haven't heard today. I want to contact every pro-Israel Christian in America. Isaiah said, you who love the Lord, keep not silent until Jerusalem becomes the praise of all the earth. On July 18th and 19th, we're going to Washington, D.C. to speak to our senators and congressmen for Israel. I want you to go with us. Phone the number at the bottom of the screen. Join us by internet. You go with us and be a part of this historic occasion when we, Christians, go to Washington for Israel's sake. You're watching the Daystar Television Network.
welcome to Ron Phillips from Ibis House. I'm Angie McGregor. I'm Pastor Ron Phillips, and I add my welcome on this beautiful Easter day. Today we're going to introduce you to a man who knew about Easter before Easter ever happened. His name was Job. He had no Bible but the stars above his head. And one day, the equivalent of Hurricane Katrina came and took the lives of his children, took away his fortune, took away everything that he had, everything but his hope in God. And in the 19th chapter of the book of Job, we have the Mount Everest of the Old Testament where Job, who had never read a word from the Bible, who had n never seen Jesus, who would come 2,000 years later, Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. And Job confessed his belief in the resurrection of the body. You stay tuned. You're going to get hope planted in your heart. Now, what would you do if your home had been blown away by Hurricane Katrina? You got terminal cancer on top of that and all your kids died in a tornado up in the Midwest. And it all happened on the same day. I want to tell you, friend, name it and claim it won't fix that. In the midst of it all, what do you do? A man without a Bible, without a pastor, without an encouraging friend, made the following confession. Oh, verse 23, Job 19, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Touch your neighbor and say they are. See, God's watching folks who learn how to live in the midst of it all. With an iron pen, he said, inscribed with an iron pen and led forever. Now listen to this. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand in the, at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know. That's twice he said no, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. 